Thank you, sir. I think it said that life is a mirror. So I was just reflecting on what you did to me. So that's why the interactions were so pleasant. Uh, we have this second patient, 65-year-old. Uh, um, he's a diabetic and hypertensive for 15 years. Not an unusual scene for us, all of us, I think, who are treating patients for a long time. He has a third heart sound, mind pedal edema, so obviously he has a good going heart failure. Evaluated on 2D echo, found to have an ejection fraction of 35%. So it is, we are dealing with a HEF ref, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And he's already on Sacubital Valsartan, obviously, uh, uh, has seen somebody. And as a first drug nowadays, it is ARNI, the Sacubital Valsartan combination. Indapamide, in this case, is not such a good choice as a diuretic for heart failure. But for hypertension, it works very well. So that's why probably he's on indapamide. His height weight is mentioned here. He's on succagliptin, metformin, glycolazide. And for all that, we know his HbA1c is 7.4, not the best. And EGFR is 70. Basically, 70 means it allows us to use many heart failure medicines with confidence. As the EGFR drops below 30, suddenly you have restrictions of A, B, C, ARNI cannot be used, spironolactone cannot be used, maybe SGLT2 can be used. And of course, it goes below frank CKDs, then we are left with only isosorbidinitride and hydralazine combination, because then you can't use these uh, drugs which I mentioned just now. So the obvious questions are what to do with the appropriate, what would be the appropriate changes? What is the evidence of SGLT2 in an established heart failure? What about saxagliptin, which I am not going to answer, so he is going to answer that. How does SGLT2 improve the heart failure? And should the other drugs like sacubitril valsartan to be stopped or not? So we'll go this uh, one by one. Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors actually are uh, kind of almost announced themselves on the horizon of heart failure a few years ago. About eight years ago, it was a paradigm trial which brought in the paradigm shift in the way we manage HFREF, and that brought in ERNI into the fray. Uh, beta blockers have been around since the late 90s. Uh, MRAs have been around for some time, but uh, the importance of MRI is realized of late, and uh, they are ahead of loop diuretics as far as management and long-term outcomes of heart failure are concerned. Loop diuretics are wonderful for symptomatic management. So once the symptoms improve, the fluid out overload goes, the loop diuretics come off, and then MRAs continue as diuretic. HGLT2 inhibitors, whether it is a MACE reduction, uh, CV death reduction, uh, cardiovascular heart failure hospitalization, everything actually it uh, improves uh, when your hazard ratio is ground down and it acts on various pathways. Very fact there are so many arrows shown that means there is no single mechanism by which it works, but it works, that's what is more important. It's said to be one of the blockbuster molecules which has arrived on the scene, not just for heart failure but very various other aspects of cardiovascular disease as such. So there are, again, uh, blood pressure reduction, albumin urea reduction, ure reduction in uric acid, reduction maybe some amount in lipids, oxidative stress reduction, weight reduction, visceral adiposity, sympathetic nervous system activity. All these things are improved upon or affected favorably in one way or the other by uh, SGLT2 inhibitors like dapagliflozin, and empagliflozin. The mechanism again, as I said, actually coming down to nitty gritty, it is a tubuloglomerular feedback improves, uh, enhanced glucosuria leads to increased ketone metabolism, which was just alluded to, and initial fluid loss also takes place because of the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. And mark the difference, this, I thought it's a visually important slide, like a person's arteriole would be something like this, or this is the intravascular compartment, that's the interstitial compartment. 
So if you give a SGLT2 inhibitors, there is shrinkage of the intravascular volume, uh, sodium loss is there, interstitial volume is drastically lost. You can see this, all this is, though it is diagrammatic for you to understand, the interstitial volume is lost to a great extent. And the intravascular, which comes through loop diuretics, loop diuretics would shrink the intravascular compartment, and the SGLT2 works on the interstitial compartment. The sodium loss would be almost identical. The interstitial volume would be almost identical, but intravascular volume is less reduced in SGLT2 inhibitors. So the long-term use of that is uh, more favorable than the loop diuretics. We know that in a heart failure situation, uh, the sympathetic nervous system is overactive so that is blocked by use of beta blockers. So that gives the benefits related to beta blockers. This, by the way, gives the maximum mortality benefits in heart failure. So in this situation, elderly man, diabetic, hypertensive, LVF 35%, beta blockers have to be on top of the prescription because of its obvious benefits. Then comes the RAS system, which is also overactive, and that's why you have to block it either with ACE or a ARB. Now, ACE was obviously the first choice for many years. ARBs were smoother varieties of ACE, may not be as effective of that. And the third group, which was identified quite late, actually is the natriuretic peptide system. That becomes inhibited uh, by neprilysin in uh, heart failure. So you have to enhance that system by giving a neprilysin inhibitor like secubitril. There were drugs which were tried before neprilysin inhibition in the past, but they caused too much uh, angioneurotic edema, so they were did not found to be useful. But finally, the scientists uh, hit upon a combination of valsartan with neprilysin inhibition. With this, what happens is the if you use the ACE inhibitor with secubitril, there will be too much angioneurotic edema. So that combination was not used, and that's why finally they stuck with the combination of valsartan with uh, secubitril, and that finally stayed, and that came to known as ERNI. So we do use beta blockers for sure. We use a combination of naprilysin inhibitor and ARB, which would be a, a secubitril valsartan or ERNI. There is one more system and a new drug on the horizon, but this being a different podium, I'll just not dis mention that as very sick, but it's another mechanism by which heart failure is taking place, and that will soon, soon be available for use in heart failure. So they thought MRAs uh, as a uh, diuretic also and acting on the myocardial fibrosis would be definitely used, ERNI definitely used, beta blockers definitely used, and now the uh, SGLT2 inhibitor with the DAPA-HF trial. So these are called the heart failure drug treatment, the Fantastic Four. If you can institute these Fantastic Four in the treatment, in the correct doses, in the first four weeks or six weeks, you are doing great justice to these patients. Remarkable improvement in cardiovascular deaths, heart failure hospitalization, improved composite endpoints. In fact, we've had patients who have gotten off the heart transplant list because their EF was 35 and now their EF is 55. And this kind of a, uh, uh, remarkable results are possible nowadays, and heart failure management has become a very rewarding management. It used to be a depressing disease for the treating doctor as well, but now with this we can get many more years of this patient, and of course better mechanical treatments are getting available as time goes by. Along with the Fantastic Four, you would be the uh, intravenous iron in the form of uh, ferric carboxymaltose, then you have hydralazine, isosorbate dinitrate, mechanical therapies, anticoagulants, supportive management, and of course, the finally going on to the very sick vats and heart transplant and other things if required. So the dapa HF trial actually, which was the cornerstone in this management, it was almost a momentous history in the war against heart failure. Because you can see the primary endpoint, first hospitalization, heart failure, and CV death, everything improves. The red and the blue bar indicates to you that it, uh, it is working very well and preventing all these complications. So whether it is person is diabetic or not, the benefits remain the same. 
So it is, despite being an oral hypoglycemic agent and known as in the past, it is working in non-diabetics as well. Fortunately, because of its mechanism of action, it doesn't cause hypoglycemia in non-diabetics. It would cause hypoglycemia only when it is combined with insulins or sulfonylureas. So when you combine that, uh, when I do that, I write to my endo friends that I have added this or EMPA into the treatment so they can adjust according to. But in non-diabetics, we can use it confidently without even thinking about hypoglycemia. The other side effects that uh, you mentioned too about the urinary side effects and balanopostitis and vulvitis, they do occur and we have to uh, warn the patient before and a little indication of hygiene and uh, other uh, aspects of treatment, probably we can prevent those complications rather than treating them after they happen. So in the foundational therapy, we have ARNI here, then you have uh, MRAs, you have beta blockers, and now the uh, AGLT2 added to this. So if you look at the one-year outpatient mortality with combinations of the foundational medical therapy, if you have only untreated patient, the red bar, he does the worst, and the green bar is where all four agents are available or instituted in the correct doses, and the patient is tolerating them well, then that has the best outcome. In other things like maybe very sick what, or maybe IV iron, maybe isocyte band armor, if it can be added, it can have additional benefits. So there is no doubt that we have to introduce SGLT2 inhibitors in this HEFREF patients which we are discussing. Despite these guidelines, only one third of patients are on target doses. Maybe lack of awareness, maybe lack of convection, maybe uh, lack of, uh, shall we say, uh, astuteness of a clinician, but we must be, uh, should be ever thinking of this, that unless we do that, we are not doing justice to these uh, individuals. Nowadays, uh, rather than going through the traditional sequencing of a beta blocker and of a diuretic, of an ERNI, and finally a GLT2, you can reverse the say or modify the sequence. Suppose the patient is sitting on a blood pressure of 90 and 100. You have given an MRA, you are hardly given any beta blocker with a maybe a evabradine for rate control. And then addition of ERNI becomes very tough in such situations. So here you can change the sequence, add the SGLT to the initial prescription, so the patient can go home from your OPD or from the hospital with a prescription of maybe just a beta blocker and a SGLT2 inhibitor. After two weeks, when things improve and the blood pressure settles down, you can add the others. So you don't have to be very fastidious about the sequence nowadays. You institute these all um, foundational four, in the correct doses, maybe to slower, smaller doses to start with, but introduce all four, titrate them up, upwards so that finally, at the end of four to six weeks, the patient is on the best possible doses. The possibility of hypotension is overcome by this because if you improve the heart failure, the blood pressure also improves. So by improving, uh, by improvement in the heart failure will improve by introduction of all four, uh, the, called as a fantastic four. And now the heart failure from prevention to treatment, if you think of, suppose on this side you have a diabetic individual, and finally he is going to lead into an end-stage heart failure because of IHD, myocardial fibrosis, hypertension, amyloidosis, or whichever way. There is a window of opportunity for treatment. You have to think of prevention of ASCVD, you have to think of even prevention of heart failure, heart failures, even HEFPEF, and even CKD, all this can be treated with the SGLT2 at all aspects, whether a diabetic with a high risk uh, individual would be going on to the canagliflozin or it could be going on to empagliflozin. There is a tapagliflozin trial as well. When it comes to HEFREF, it is more towards DAPA. When it comes to HEFPEF, it is more towards EMPA. And there are other uh, SGLT2 inhibitors which are also uh, available and can be used very effectively. So along the entire spectrum, SGLT2 inhibitors going to help your way. So in uh, olden uh, classic Hindi movie called Pyasa, uh, there used to be a song on Champi, uh, and it, he would say that Sab lafdo ki ek dawa hai kyun na aaj He was talking about Champi, but SGLT2 inhibitors have become like this for heart failure. 
all aspects starting from preventing to end stage. You can use them and use them very effectively. Safe molecules don't cause any hemodynamic disturbances. Finally, India is getting reasonably pocket-free, uh, pocket-friendly SGLT2 inhibitors, let's say. So as I said, there's uh, even Emperor Preserve study, which is a HEFPEF, a different heart failure to treat. In them, uh, definite uh, improvement is shown, shown with, at least as of today by m -pangliflozin. Um, so in 2019, ESC guidelines for diabetes, pre-diabetes and cardiovascular disease, type 2 drives a drug naive patient, if the ASCVD risk is very high, you can straight away shift to uh, SGLT2 inhibitor. And if the risk is not very high, you can stick to the traditional metformin or monotherapy. Type 2 diabetes, uh, on metformin already very high risk, add SGLT2 inhibitor. And you, if they're not high risk, then continue on metformin monotherapy is how we can think of and broad distinctions based on logic and also based on statistics. The 2022 AHACC, American Cardi College of Cardiology guidelines recommend the SGLT2 inhibitor 1A for inpatients with symptomatic chronic HFREF. They are recommended to reduce hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular mortality irrespective of the presence of type 2 diabetes. Why there is so much discussion related to uh, prevention of hospitalization or heart failure? Because the maximum, shall we say, expenditure, almost 85% of the expenditure of a heart failure person comes through hospitalization. So you reduce that, there is a big benefit. Also, every hospitalization means the patient is spiraling down towards negativity on death. So if you prevent that, probably that drug is uh, useful for the patient and uh, for the person who is managing that patient. And the future studies are impact MI and there are other trials, dipagliflozin cardiovascular outcome study in diabetes. All this help us to suggest that uh, SGLT2 is here to stay. And in our patient, what would we do is what I should think of now. Sir, are you going to cover all this later? How? Huh. So in this patient of ours, uh, definitely he would be on a beta blocker. I will change that endapamide to an MRI with a loop diuretic maybe initially. I would introduce 10 milligrams of dapagliflozin because in heart failure, there is no titration of SGLT, simple. Whatever is the patient, start with 10, stick to 10. So that is easy also, no, no titration is required. He's already on ERNI. So at the end of two weeks or two months from the starting of treatment, my patient would be on 25 milligrams of spironolactone, 200 milligrams twice a day of ERNI, 10 milligrams of dapagliflozin, and the best tolerated rated dose of beta blockers with or without uh, evabradine. If I do that, I'm confident if the patient doesn't have terrible coronary artery disease, LV is going to improve. I shall stop there.